that like to catch 500 fish in a day? <laughs> Stupid. Hey everyone, John here from Cast and Spear, and today we have somebody super amazing on the podcast, a living legend. His name is Steve Wozniak. No, not the Apple guy. Even better, the number four world record holder, according to IFGA for fishing. In 2010, he hit a thousand different species of fish, and right now he is working his way towards 2,000. This guy is no joke, and he is super awesome because he's sharing his tips and tricks on what made him successful with you guys. So, if you're excited, I was super stoked that Steve was willing to come on the podcast, and he's going to jump in right now with what got him passionate about fishing. So, the passion for fishing was always there. I always just thought it was a, a fun, cool thing to do. Um, I'd probably have to say, you know, that, that my dad, um, you know, got me into that. Um, when I was a kid, you know, my dad and I are not actually particularly close. Um, but you know, that's kind of the first exposure to fishing I got was, uh, you know, the, the, uh, with my old man and, and, you know, getting out a couple times. And as I got into college and was responsible for my own time and, uh, uh, you know, had a vehicle and all that other good stuff. Um, you know, then I, I started branching out a lot more. Um, and, you know, finding out I really loved it and, you know, could actually make some time to go do it where I wasn't, you know, uh, uh, having to you know, worry about somebody else planning it for me and, and taking all that time and all that good stuff. So, you know, th that's loved it as a kid, but really got into it as an adult. In this part of the podcast, Steve talks about what is species hunting, how he was able to catch 500 fish in one day and why he thinks species hunting is for everyone. So species hunting is, uh, or, or life listing. There's a, a couple different ways or things people call it is just as simple as keeping a list of all the, the species or, or types of fish you've caught. You know, it can be as, as basic or broad or undefined as you want it to be. Some people track every possible subspecies. Some people, you know, will even track different uh, uh, types, you know, male uh, uh, golden trout and female golden trout because they look different. So it, it's whatever your journey is about. And, you know, for a lot of folks, it, it's a lot of the fun in there is getting in and, and scientifically identifying, you know, whether you caught, you know, a three toed shiner or a, a bluefin shiner. Um, and there are exuberant arguments over this and all kinds of other, uh, uh, d you know, havoc that generally involves a scientist to settle it. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's just as simple or hard as you want it to be and getting started can be going to the, you know, the nearest Creek, because there's likely something that lives in it. In my case, California roach, um, that you can catch. doesn't matter how small it is, how big it is, you know, a, a blue Marlin or a California roach both count as one on a, uh, life list. Now, is there a proper way to track these things or is it up to the individual angler? There's no one standard that I'm aware of for it. You know, there are some, some organizational tools and principles I like. You know, folks usually, Excel is a pretty powerful tool. So folks will have an Excel that's sortable by, you know, a, an accepted common name or, or one of a set of common names, scientific name. Um, I've seen some guys that do it by also sortable by the family. Um, but my list, you'd have, you know, the, the most likely common name and that can kill you because you get into South America, every country has got a fish called a Corvina and every one of them is a different species. I went for years of my life thinking, you know, I'd only caught one fish all up and down the, the East coast of, of South America. And it turned out to be like seven different croakers. Um, so sorting it that way. And so I've got, I'm looking at mine right now. I've got a common name, um, a photo reference, you know, what date photo file it's in and the number of the photo that has both me and the fish and then a good close-up photo of the fish, you can see the ID characteristics, the scientific name, uh, the country it was caught in, the, the state, region, or uh, uh, body of water, the bait, the date of catch, and the identification notes, and the name of the guide, if there was a guide. How do you keep track of this stuff while you're out actually fishing? Do you just use your phone and just take notes and kind of come back to your computer later and add it, populate it, or do you have so, a different method? 
I, you know, some of it's scribbling stuff, you know, it, it kind of depends on the scenario. You know, if I'm out um, someplace stupid or dangerous, I'm probably not going to bring my phone out. So you just remember it or you, you take a lot of photos um, with a waterproof camera um, and, you know, take notes on your phone if you get a chance. Um, you know, the other, uh, 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 you know, paper notes work just as well um, if you're over 40. You know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, unless like people sometimes track, like I also track just the raw number of fish I caught. And that's kind of handy, you know, to, to just make a scratch on a piece of paper or a note in your phone. Cause you know, I I've caught, I've had days I caught 500 fish. And so keeping track of those, you know, just by memory would not be, uh, uh especially appealing. What's that like to catch 500 fish in a day? <laughs> Stupid is what it's like. It was specifically, I, I, in 2002, I, I, I set a goal. I wanted to see if I could catch a thousand fish, um, in a year and went through it. I mean, it was challenging, but when you, you, you try to catch numbers, you know, you got like rock cod fishing or you get out, uh, uh, you know, bass fishing in some, some areas like, you know, the, the spotted bass up here at say Lake Oroville can be a numbers thing. You know, you get 20, 30, 40, you know, fish in a day, um, you can add them up. And so when in, in like 2006, which was a year that I pretty much took off, uh, the company I worked for had gotten bought out. I was not in a huge hurry to go back to work. Um, and so I, I ended up gunning for 3000 fish that year. And I was nowhere close really in early December. And I went down to Santa Cruz pier and said, you know, if I can get a few hundred fish today, I was at like, you know, 2,400 or something. I said, if I can get a whole bunch of fish today, maybe I'll, I'll get a crack at this. I know I was going to Hawaii right at the, the last few days of the year. And that's always big numbers and brought out the sabikis, which are the species hunters friend. Um, and started dropping sabikis at Santa Cruz pier. And that time of year, if, if the bait fish are in, it can just get stupid. And there is still a, 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 a Greek family that is singing my praises, even from 12 years ago, because they saw me start catching all these sardines. Most of it was sardines. I caught some other strange stuff, you know, a bunch of anchovies, some little horse mackerel, sand dabs, a couple perch, but, you know, 400 of the fish were, were uh, sardines, which are considered edible by those guys. By a lot of folks, I just don't like them. And so he's like, are you keeping those? And I said, no, do you want them? And they ended up making two runs home to dump the cooler by the time I was done. Wow. Um, but I stopped at 500. And so that, that easily put me in position to get to the 3,000, um, which is just one of those stupid, you know, uh, uh, lift making things that my Marta, my wife would, you know, call more pathological psychology than constructive fishing, but, you know, get me out of trouble for a day. So what are you at right now, species wise? Species wise, I have 1,827 species on my list. You know, the, the thing I really enjoy about it, it is something that is just inclusive for everybody. It can make a challenge, you know, somebody who lives someplace that, you know, they can't go out and do spectacular saltwater fishing every day. I mean, California, we're so fortunate, you know, I can drive down to Emeryville and jump on a party boat and be on good salmon or halibut or striped bass or rock cod or sturgeon. Um, somebody who can't do that can still make an angling challenge every weekend because kind of no matter where you live with certain exceptions, but you know, there's going to be a species, you know, in, in an easy day trip from you that you haven't caught, you know, these, these can be dace, minnows, you know, mad toms, all kinds of weird stuff. And, you know, biodiversity does increase as you head east and south, but there's still, even out west here, there's, there's plenty of stuff to catch. And so I think it, it, it's a good challenge for everybody. And catching a small fish, I mean, you know, I've, I've caught species anywhere from, you know, less than an ounce to close to a thousand pounds. But catching some of the small stuff can be a bear. You know, some of these darters, like creek darters, uh, uh, back in the, the Midwest and, and, and Central U.S., they're just, you know, I, I've chased one of those around for hours and still my God. Now, is that, um, so, is that know, kind it, of like the uh, micro fishing? Yeah, that's one, you know, to, to get a big species list, you have to do 
a fair bit of micro fishing. No question about that. You know, it, it's, you know, to, to when you, you start getting the, these large lists and, you know, these guys, you know, if you're at 500, you're probably top 25 in the world. Um, and anybody who's going to do that is, is doing two things. They're traveling at least a good bit. Okay. And they're fishing for everything, you know, so you might spend like in Australia, you know, sure. I'd troll from my black Marlin and, and the big stuff all day, but then at night, you know, when the crew anchored up and then got just unbelievably drunk, um, you know, I would be sitting there with like a big bait down on the bottom at the anchorage, a couple of smaller rigs, and then throwing a sabiki around waiting for those to go. And I would do that well into the evening and then just catch up on sleep when we were trolling. And, you know, doing that stuff, or when I was down in the Amazon, you know, doing the peacock bass fishing, you know, the guys were all up, uh, 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 you know, partying or playing cards or whatever. And I was down at the dock, uh, uh, catching the little Amazon stuff that lives under the dock and fending off a crocodile, which is a whole nother story. Well, you got to go into that. Although story. That, what was that like? <laughs> well, that crocodile ended up being my friend. So I, I, I did not realize I saw some surface activity, um, and started throwing a wood chopper because I thought maybe it was some, some peacocks going at night. And threw a wood chopper a couple of times and uh, then saw something kept going over there and about the third or fourth time. And I don't know if he hit it or I snagged him, but this, I think they're called Jockadai. It's a, a, but it's a darn crocodile. I mean, it's a, a big lizard with a lot of teeth and a bad attitude. And I hooked it and it went flat out nuts. And I realized, of course, it was not a fish at that stage. But then, of course, it figures out I'm the one who threw the thing that hurt its face. And so it, it comes at the dock. It figures it's just going to come talk it out with me. And so luckily, I ran up the stairs, which it wasn't capable of doing, um, before it got to the dock. Because then it got on the dock and walked around and looked for me a bit. And then it went away. So that, that was not a pretty time. And then the, the lure just fell out of its face. So I got my lure back. That fish became my – or that uh, – uh, lizard became my friend for life about two nights later there was a guy in camp who was driving me crazy and i had stuck fishing with him for a couple of days and he believed he should go in the front of the boat at all times because he was just a superior fisherman to me which he may have been but we we're both paying the same and uh so he the, the first day he just says that you know he's just such a well-known bass tournament fisherman that he has to go in the front of the boat all day because I don't understand, you know, the responsibility of being in front of the boat. And so I said, okay, tell you what, tomorrow, whoever's down here first, um, you know, because he was not exactly an early riser, whoever's down here first can take the front of the boat for the first half of the day. So he went down the night before and put his gear in the boat. But I saw that because I was up on the dock fishing. And this probably is not a nice thing for me to admit in public like this, but we won't name his name, Lewis. And so I went up to the kitchen and got some of the old chicken from dinner and put the old chicken from dinner on his equipment bag as an offering to the crocodile. And boy, when we got there in the morning, they had had their way with it. Really? <laughs> and then he's freaking out. I'm like, what's going on? I said, you don't, you don't mean to tell me you put your stuff down here the night before and we're being dishonest. But yeah, he didn't say a thing, but it was a, uh, you, you can definitely tell you would not have wanted to have been that equipment bag. It's not the worst thing I've ever done to someone, but it's close. All right. That does it for this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I loved some of Steve's stories. They're awesome. And he has really turned me on to species hunting. I have started my life list and I will start diligently documenting all my future catches. And I hope you do the same. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a future episode. Even better, if you can share it with three of your friends, that would help us tremendously. And if you want to hear something specific on the podcast, go to chasmspear.com forward slash contact and shoot me a note. I'd love to know future guests you'd like to hear, maybe certain topics you want us to cover. But until next time, keep those lines tight, everyone. See ya.